Welcome aboard the Noob Spirit Podcast. I am the host, Isaac, aka Shrek. I'm super excited about today's interview. This guy is very interesting. Always learning is this kind of his, his go-to saying, and it makes sense when, you, when I chatted with him. We talk about vacuum packing, um, vacuum sealing fish, and how much of a game changer it is. We talk about smoking fish. We talk about bush food and going bush. We talk about just being handy and adventurous and trying stuff and getting out of your comfort zone. And uh, Josh, really interesting dude. I'd encourage you to follow him along on Instagram. It's Bosch, B-O-S-H dot Jolen, J-O-L-L-E-N on Instagram. Always up to adventures, always doing interesting things with his seafood and an awesome contributor to our book, 99 Spare Recipes, which is live on Kickstarter. It's beating down into its final week. I'm super excited. We've met our funding goal, but I'd love it if you got on and back this project because you love it and because you believe in it. And uh, there's a whole bunch of awesome um, reward tiers available. One of the um, packages that hasn't fully sold out yet is a weekend over camping and spearing with me on Stratty, very much catching cooking, and uh, probably we'll have at least one featured uh, Spiro chef from the uh, book that will come along on the trip with me and we'll have an absolute blast over there doing that. Check that out. That's one of the package, one of the reward packages available. Uh, 99 Spiro Recipes on Kickstarter right now. If you go to noobspiro.com forward slash 99 recipes, it'll take you to the Kickstarter campaign. Get in there, get hold of it. Also, guys, the USA Freshwater Nationals is up 2022. Check it out at rockymountainspearfishing.org. It's in... Lake Powell, Utah, April 29th and 30th. Check that out, USA Freshwater Nationals. I want to get into today's interview, but let's have a quick listen to Kurt Raymond with Anuba Story, who left it on noobspiro.com up in the Anuba Spiro's story section. Check it out. Hey, Isaac. It's Kurt here from Exhale Adventures up in a beautiful Mackay, Queensland. I started my spearfishing journey about four years ago now, and Noob Spiro played a big part in my early progression. Everyone listening to this will already know how great the podcast is, but my main message is to not underestimate the info available in the older podcasts. Go back, have a listen if you haven't already. Not every tip and piece of info will be relevant for your diving, but it's a goldmine of actionable info. You might find yourself listening to a diver from another country, diving areas and hunting species you may not even have in your country. But you'll find there'll be some carryover with hunting techniques, gear setup, and even safety protocols. So yeah, go back, have a listen, see what little tips you can pick up and include on your next dive day. Cheers. And without too much more mucking around, guys, thanks, Kurt, for that voicemail. Let's get into today's episode with Josh Bond. I can't wait to get into today's episode, brought to you with proud partner, adreno.com.au. The Noob Spirit Podcast has been partnering with adreno.com.au for more than 100 episodes, and these guys are awesome. They have uh, huge spearfishing mega stores all over the country. You can shop online or in store. Use the code Noob Spiro whenever you spend more than $200, and you will automatically save $20. That's right, use the code Noob Spiro online or in store when you spend more than $200 and save 20 bucks. I love these guys. I remember the first time I bought a spear gun at adreno.com.au down at the Wool and Gabba store. And Adreno have been a huge part of the excitement that I have about spearfishing. Check them out at adreno.com.au. Use the code Noob Spiro to save. Neptonics was founded in 1996, making trigger mechs in a barn in the Santa Cruz Mountains. Solid gear that works was their founding principle and it still rings true today in every pull of a Neptonics trigger, in every snap of a Neptonics band, and in every whiz of a Neptonics spear gun reel, singing with the power of another big fish. Got a great deal, you can use the code NOOB10 to save 10% off anything and everything at Neptonics.com. It's solid gear that works, equipment you can rely on. Save 10% off any order at Neptonics.com when you use the code NOOB10. Support for the Noob Spirit Podcast is brought to you by Manscaped, who is the best in men's below-the-waist grooming champions of the world. Manscaped offer precision-engineered tools for your family jewels. Manscaped just launched their fourth-generation trimmer, the Lawn Mower 4.0, all across Australia and New Zealand. You heard that right, the 4.0. Join over 2 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped with this exclusive offer for you. 20% off free worldwide shipping with the code NoobSparrow in one word, NoobSparrow, one word, at manscaped.com. Well, uh, today I'm absolutely sport. I've got Josh Bollin on the uh, line right now. Josh, um, mate, you've submitted some cracker recipes for the 99 Sparrow uh, Recipes book. 
It's an absolute pleasure to have you uh, on the show. I've um, been following along on your Instagram journey and sort of stalking you. Does that does that worry you? Um, not particularly. It's good to know that someone's appreciating a bit of work, <laughs> at least. Mate, you do some good work. You're um, you're an interesting chap. One of your at the top of your profile, it says always learning. What is that yeah. to you? Um, look, I think my friends would describe me as a sort of jack of all trades. I think my interest in things always jumps and changes. And like we were just talking about, I haven't been in the water for a little while. And like part of that's been for me doing a lot of work on my four wheel drive and stuff. Yeah. Um, I love my camping. I love my traveling and exploring and yeah, there's just lots of like always trying to grow myself and learn and it doesn't really matter to me so much as to what I'm learning about, but I always just want to be learning. That's how I sort of get my kicks in life, I think. Yeah, nice. So, yeah. As a result of my stalking, I found out that you have a, have an interest in jewellery. and uh, I do, I do. I dabbled in it myself when I was younger. Yeah? I came with a lot of abalone shell in New Zealand or power and mm. um, tried to make a few different things and, like, get the old grinding wheel out and uh, just fill your sinuses up with goodness. Have you done a bit of that yourself? Uh, I have, yeah. I started um, quite a while ago and sort of just left it alone for a while. Still sort of under that whole jack of all trades kind of thing. I think it's something I dabbled in a while ago. I haven't really touched it for a little while, but definitely it's a good one to get into when the water's not so good and you can't dive like we're sort of having at the moment here in Sydney. So. Yeah, but it's definitely it's a beautiful way to sort of um, share the ocean with people because I think there's a lot of people who I know who haven't don't really explore the ocean as much, but you can sort of show them the sort of things that do exist in the ocean. Like you wouldn't think that when you look at an abalone and you look at the foot of an abalone, you wouldn't think that there's something that beautiful behind that foot. Mm. I think hundred yeah. percent. Some of the most beautiful stuff in the world. Like I've had um. Josh Humbert on, who's a Tahitian pearl farmer, and uh, Sven Franklin from Melbourne. He's a he's a jeweler as well um, by trade as well, and he he actually ended up making my engagement ring and wedding ring. So it's a very small and funny world the spearfishing world we live in. People have got an amazing array of different hobbies. Um, it seems like you've got a bit of a like a, a I don't know how what, how would you say it? like a an orientation towards nature in general, like a you're very interested in like bush food, um, cooking your own food, but paired with that, like is an amazing um, sort of respect for plating food as well. Like um, it's something I've never been able to do. It's uh, apply yeah. that level of attention to detail to plating. I don't mind cooking something, but it comes to the plating and I'm just like, just throw it on and let's eat it. Kind of thing. Uh, that's it. It's um, I think I was super lucky. I definitely wouldn't call myself a chef. I would never disrespect real chefs by doing that. I think there's a lot of people who dedicate their lives and sacrifice a lot to be a chef. But I did work as a cook for a little while. Yeah. And um, my sort of my mentor when I was doing that said, uh, and it's always stuck with me, people eat with their eyes. So, mm. well, I'll be honest with you, like, when I first started cooking and stuff, some of the things I was posting, they didn't always taste the best. They didn't always sort of like, you know, but as long as it's, it looks good, it, people can still find an appreciation for it. Yeah. I think that's, it starts there. And it's like, it big thing for me is trying to um, engage people with their food. I think it, it goes with the whole spear fishing thing. That's sort of how I started with it all was, I feel like there's such a big, disconnect from for people now with their food and how they that food comes to them and how yeah there's a complete disconnect between the food that gives you life and like it, to me that's a very strange concept that people can just have food delivered to their door with no understanding like fully prepared food that you microwave and stuff and i understand for some people that there's not a lot of time to cook and in the world we live in now unfortunately but I hope maybe that like it just at least my presentation of food and I try and sort of capture the process of cooking. So I'll have maybe a video of me spearfishing and taking the shot. And then from that, I'll have the fish itself. So you can see 
the process that went into that to then the cooking of it. And then, as you said before, mentioned the plating of it. I mean, that's been one for me. A lot of people are grossed out by their food, but they're happy to eat quite fancy food at a restaurant. Mm -hmm. So if I can prepare something that people can sort of feast with their eyes and appreciate the plating of it, but then also show them that this is where it actually comes from. This is what is actually feeding you. It's a it's a strange one too, isn't it? Because it's like when you have that dawning sense of awareness, I think like, oh, my food comes from somewhere and I should probably be involved at least to understand where it comes from. It mm. either makes you a vegetarian or makes you a hunter or, or a spirit. Definitely. I mean, yeah. It's, it's always a struggle. Like I still go to the supermarket all the time, but there's definitely a goal at some point to be able to at least, have a deeper connection with my food down the line. And um, yeah, I, it's just, it's an important thing. It, it gives you life. It gives you energy to go about your life. So what did you, so where are you in Sydney? Uh, Northern beaches. Okay. Have you always grown up in Sydney or were you a farm boy? What's the story? Nah, super privileged. Always grown up in Sydney, but um, on the Northern beaches. So again, super lucky here with, I'm surrounded by bushland. Literally, my front door, and there's bushland. And I used to just, when we grew up as kids, we used to just run into there and just get lost all day, you know. And there was there wasn't so much a dinner bell. You might not always be able to hear it. You're that sort of far away. But definitely, when the sun started going down, um, I lived near uh, a big water system, so you just you just know to go head uphill. Mm. By the time the sun was coming down, uphill, and then you sort of figure out wherever you are and start wandering home from that and that was how I spent my childhood so so you were a, you were a victim of free range parenting to a to an extent definitely to an extent but I I definitely sorted out myself yeah. uh, it was definitely something I needed so is there something to that do you think like in terms of <clears throat> making you kind of a, a self-authoring sort of you know like you know a person who's you know kind of uh, self-responsible self-reliant resilient is that something, would you attribute that to your upbringing? Definitely, definitely very independent. I think, um, and sort of like somewhat introverted by nature as well. Mm. Um, so I definitely, I mean, talking about jack of all trades and all that kind of stuff, I like taking deep dives into things. And, um, something, a uh, way I discussed it with my mates is um, things as rabbit holes. So <laughs> you sort of, as I mean, all of us probably know with spearfishing, it is a bit of a rabbit hole. You sort of, 100%. a friend takes you out or you watch a video on YouTube and then all of a sudden you're looking at thousands of dollars worth of diving gear and justifying <laughs> to yourself why that why that's a good idea. Yep. Yeah. Most expensive way to catch free fish. Exactly, exactly. I can't remember who said that the first time, but it stuck with me. Um, that's a good one. Yeah, it, yeah, it, 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 it puts it in context. Um, I guess... One thing that comes out loud and clear is, yeah, you, you, you're definitely drawn towards nature, whether it's in the bush or in the ocean, and uh, you seem to have an experimental mindset. Like It seems like you're quite prepared to just have a crack, roll up your sleeves, and just see if you can figure something out. Um, I noticed you started doing, like, vacuum-packed, like I saw that one, one of your posts was a smoky ramen pack, where basically mm. you had vacuum-packed, all the ingredients and you made, were you headed out bush and then putting that together somewhere or? That was actually for a mate. A mate of mine asked me to make it for his girlfriend. So I've been doing a few of them recently. Um, just because we're in lockdown and everything, we haven't been able to sort of catch up with mates as much as we wanted. And a few of my mates have just seen the stuff I was doing. They're like, do you mind if I sort of uh, have some, you know? Mm. And it started with a mate of mine who I dive with a lot. Um, of course we can go diving, but we couldn't cook the fish together. He's not so much into the cooking of the fish for, he loves his cooking, but like, I wish I could have been able to cook the fish for him and sort of show him what you could do with it. Mm. So I packed it all into, um, vacuum seal packs and then I dropped it off at his place for him to have. And it's been an awesome way to connect with people while we sort of yeah, haven't been able to catch up with mates. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Sounds like maybe a bit of a love language of yours, the old gifts. Definitely. I think hospitality was a huge part of my life um, when I finished school. Yeah. And I really connected with that ability. I Not so much. Uh, I struggle with people in a larger context. I'm not good in crowds and all that kind of thing. So 
Mm. I struggled with the customer service side of things, but when you did have a good customer, it, there's something super rewarding about being able to provide them an awesome experience, an awesome night, and to help them appreciate food and drink or whatever it may be. Yeah, cool. Awesome. Let's dig into some infinite practicality. So vacuum packing is a bit of a game changer. Would you agree with that? Definitely is, definitely is. I One big thing for me, though, is I would wish that there was a way to make that more um green environment. yeah more green more green um so it is a thing it is a, definitely a game changer it changes the way you can store fish or um even provide fish for other people like in the ramen packs and that kind of thing yeah i agree i agree it um it changes the shelf life of food and it um in terms of like caring for your catch like vacuum packing fish seems to be like if you want to freeze something for any length of time uh mm. But like freezer bags, just the game is over within you know a, m- a month at most. Whereas vacuum packs, sometimes you can pull something out three months old and it's still fine. Yeah, definitely, definitely helps. I have found a tip people potentially if they are looking at getting a vacuum packer, you have to be careful with things like fish wings yep. um, and other maybe pieces that still have bones in them because those bones can puncture the bags. <laughs> I've had a lot of problems with that. But it's, as long as it's loins and fillets and that kind of thing, you're usually perfectly fine. When I was out on the Eastern Voyager and we were vacuum packing out there, they had um, like styrofoam sort of packing to put around the wings and stuff. Have you tried that? Mm. No, I haven't. I might have to give that a go. Are they the sort of packing peanuts you find around? Oh, no, nah, more like the um, butcher's trays. You know, like you buy a tray of meat. Oh, yeah. You know, the yep. packing trays and stuff. If Even with wings, you could um, use a tray on the bottom, put the wings in it, then put a tray upside down on top, then put it in a mm. bag. bag and uh, I, I'm getting, They'll keep for months. So I still haven't pulled out my wings and done a wing night yet. But um, how, how good, awesome, mate. Yeah, how good are wings, man? Mate, I think it's something that people are starting, like definitely cracking onto now. Like everyone I talk to sort of understands the wings and that. So it's yeah. definitely a big part of the culture now. But that's... Easily one of my favorite parts of the fish. And like, if anyone hasn't already tried the wings, it's the same way you have dark meat on a chicken thigh. Yeah. It's dark meat of fish. It, it's insane how juicy and tender it is. Oh. It's like, and it's almost impossible to overcook. Yeah. Compared to fillets and stuff, which can be very temperamental in drying out and flaking and that kind of thing. Yeah, that's a really good point. Mo- moist and succulent, particularly that bit straight under that um, that fin there on the side. Oh, mm. good stuff. You just suck it straight out to yeah. the little, little <laughs> scoop of the bone there. Goodness. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah 100%. Um, it. With the fillets, like it's a good point you make. Um, I think, and I've had this conversation a few times recently, um, thickness of fillets, density of the fish fillet itself, how do people work out how long to cook things for? Like, do you do you personally, when you were starting, did you err on the underside of cooking and then just put it back in the pan or the oven later if you had to? Or what's your um, – how do you work around that? Do you use a, a – um, I'm quite adventurous with my food, um, and I, I have quite a strong constitution. I've eaten a lot of, eaten a lot of things that – other people sort of turn their nose up. Usually it's the sniff test for me. As long as it doesn't smell too bad, I can get it down. Yeah. Um, so I always err uh, on the side of undercooked. Yeah. Um, because with fish as well, especially, it's going to continue cooking once you take it out of the pan. So I don't eat a lot of fillets these days. I usually like the sashimi or uh, prepare it into other things. Yep. Um, but definitely if I'm cooking a fillet, I'm going for a sear uh, on each side. So relatively hot temperature, and I'm not cooking many fillets for much longer than two minutes, three minutes. Yeah, right. I don't know if that's right or not, but that's how I've been doing it. Because, yeah, a lot of the time the fish will continue steaming on the plate once you take it out of the pan, and it'll keep cooking. Mm. But I'm only cooking fillets probably three, four centimetres thick. Yeah. I'm not sure how many. Maybe two. That is in... An inch and a half, two inches sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. That sort of thing, yeah. Yeah, righto. Okay, cool. So you, you mentioned before, like, food was kind of like your gateway drug into the spearfishing world. Is that is that right? Definitely. Definitely. That's, I think uh, I'm an apprentice carpenter surgery now, so my pay's increased a little bit, but 
I've always had a love for food. Um, and I think that started with my parents. Um, they had a game we played because I think whether me or my brother were fussy eaters, um, anytime we tried something new, we got a dollar, <laughs> which wasn't big money for them. But for me and my brother, when we were four or five years old, that was, that was pretty huge. You know, it could change the course of your week. Um, yeah, that's so kind of clever. Okay. Yeah. So I really, I appreciate them a lot for doing that because there was a time we were in, um, Noosa actually, and we found these, these balls that I wanted and my, I asked my parents and they were like, no, 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 you can't have it. You can't have it. Like, we're not just going to buy you that, blah, blah, blah. But we did have this game. So we went out for dinner that night and on the menu, there was a seafood platter. And on that seafood platter was a lot of things that I'd never eaten, like things that are like Batman bugs or oysters and prawns and like just a big mixed basket. Yeah. And I sort of, I sort of looked at it and I was like, there's there's so many things on here that I've never eaten. I can get a few dollars out of this one. (laughs) So meanwhile, meanwhile, my parents are paying like 50 bucks. For the platter. Get me this seafood platter. (laughs) <laughs> but I'm trying new things. So I think it definitely started there and I've always loved good food. Um, but just it gets expensive, especially especially seafood. It's insane. When I sort of look sometimes at the fish I'm catching or the things I'm eating and then you go to a fish market where um in my opinion, uh the fish you get from a fish market is never gonna be the same as well you can get yourself and if you properly take care of it. And I stand for a lot of people, they don't have the skills to go fishing themselves, so that's their way to do it. Um, that's when they need friends like you. Exactly. Yeah, I do have a few friends asking for fish, but yeah, me too. it hasn't got to that point yet. It's all for me at the moment. <laughs> um, cool. So yeah, definitely love my food. Your parents served you up the seafood platter at a restaurant. You made 15 bucks. You bought the things you wanted. And uh, and that's how pretty much your love affair started. I'd say so. That's that's the biggest point I can think of. How old are you, man? I'm 23. Gee, because you got a you got a lot of wisdom on you for 23. When when did the spearfishing journey start? Uh, spearfishing started for me back in 2019. Uh, I was living in the UK just after school. Uh, I've got family over there, so I spent a year living over there, very much in the party lifestyle deep in the hospitality world then sort of working in bars and nightclubs and um it was interesting for me because it was the first time i've been away from the bush and away from nature um the uk has a lot of nature but it's also so densely populated that it's hard to escape that and i it took me a while to realize what was sort of going on but i realized i was i hadn't seen bushland and stuff or nature for even like a like a few months and it was really getting to me Yep. Um, so spear fishing was something that I was watching videos of like the classic like Brody Moss and like Harry Lindley, Ryan Myers, all those kind of people spear fishing. And I just sort of said to myself while I was over there, I was like, when I get home, this is what I want to do because this connects me to so many different aspects and areas of my life I can bring together in this one thing. Mm. And it's, to be honest, one of the first things that I've properly stuck with for an extended period in my life my hobbies have always kind of come and gone but spear fishing has stayed which has been awesome it's an infinitely it's an infinitely complex sport i think at times like uh but i would love to hear what are the aspects of it that grab you like i think it was like we sort of discussed the connection to your food and the way you can directly be a part of the food that feeds you um, I think mean, the time in nature as well. It's while we all say you got to go with buddies and stuff, and I think if you're ever looking to improve your skills, you can't really improve your skills if you're solo diving. Mm. Um, which for me was a massive thing because for the first good while I was solo diving, I wasn't part of club. I didn't really have any mates who were interested, and if they were, they weren't at all interested to the point that I was where I wanted to sort of learn and push myself. Um, What about the physicality side of it? Like the free diving, the hunting, how have you found that? And you've been going sort of two, possibly two and a half years. How hmm. how has that progressed for you? Have you had any struggles in that area, in those areas? I've definitely grown. 
but it's been a sort of slow growth. Like just sort of saying, not having dive buddies and not being able to push yourself so much. It, it took a while for me to get that confidence to sort of meet new people and join clubs and things like that. I was a part of a club for a while and I found that super valuable. I always recommend that to people when they first start. Um, it was a massive eye-opener to the wealth of knowledge of some of the senior guys who have been diving these areas for 50 years plus, maybe, some of them. Yep. And they can, depending on the weather or whatever it may be, they can sort of go, oh, they're going to go to this spot and you're going to look under this rock and you're going to find this. And they And you see that in comps as well. The older guys who have been diving for so long, they just sort of somehow, like, I'll be out, I'm like, I didn't see any fish, but yet they come back with a full, like, Hessian sack full of fish. <laughs> and you're like, how did, how did this happen? Yeah, yeah. So it's a lo- lifetime immersed in nature, I think, too, uh, uh, observing. Um, have you enjoyed sort of being part of that ecosystem, observing sort of, you know, the cycles and and and, and things under, under the water? Definitely. Um, I find it a lot. I find animals a lot easier to sort of uh, understand and get along with than people sometimes. I like a lot of anxiety and stuff. I, think. I was listening to your episode with uh, Tim Coverman the other day, yeah. and that really sort of resonated with me. The sort of yeah. I will get to the, the fear part later because I think that's interesting to talk about. But um, definitely the anxiety stuff. It's Sort of let, that was to do with like not finding dive buddies and all that kind of stuff, but sort of overcoming that and realizing that it, it is important to connect with people and, um, yeah, the animals and being able to observe them is super interesting to me. And having some really, really special experiences recently, um, came across a massive school, probably like 150, 200 cow nose rays. Oh, wow. Just on, uh, off the northern beaches, which is that your, is that your profile awesome. photo? That is the one, yeah. That is the one. That's sick. Super man. lucky. A really good mate of mine, um, Davis Curry. He's an absolute legend. Like young lad, and he's actually been my mentor a lot of uh, whiskey fishing, to be honest. Yep. Like uh, five years younger than me, I think. But it's shocking the skill and the natural skill and ability of some of the younger lads sometimes. Yeah. So, yep. a big eye opener. Um, yeah, he's got an awesome photography page. So if anyone's out there, check it out for sure. Is Davis um, Curry? Davis Curry. Uh, Davis and then Curry with a K. K O O R E Y. Cool. I'll link that up in today's um, show notes at Noob Spear. It'll be noobspear.com forward slash Bolin. And uh, I noticed with your Instagram uh, profile, you did bosch.jolin. Very clever. That's it. That's <laughs> it. It's always been my thing, is the Bosch thing. Yeah, okay, right, eh? Bosch, because you love Bosh the bush. Oh, I should change it to that, eh? Bush John. <laughs> it sounds like a celebrity chef's name, like a bush cook or something. I was going to actually no. talk to you about bush food and going bush. Like, um, you're doing up your Hilux at the moment. It seems like um, getting out and amongst it is kind of what you're up to. Like, um, Definitely. bush food, learning about bush food, um, and just daring to sort of go out there and get out of your comfort zone with it. Like, um, yeah, how did you learn start learning about bush food? I guess like, did you have some mentors? Um, it's a tricky one in Australia. I, it's Australia has such a depth of to uh, the well, the ecosystem is so deep. I think you could say, and a lot of the knowledge unfortunately has been lost because of the history of this country. Mm. Um, and that's something that I'm trying to work towards understanding better is how the indigenous people of this country lived and interacted with the land because it's not the most effective way that we're currently doing it. I don't think, I think there's a lot of better ways we could do it. And a lot of, a lot more stuff that comes from this country that we could utilize that we don't because it's not things people are familiar with because it's not what Europe does. It's not what the U S does, but, yeah. Things that can only grow here, things that can only sort of exist here, and we don't utilize them enough, I think. Mm-hmm. But unfortunately, there's not a lot of information out there. You have to really sort of look hard to find it, especially in this country, because it's not understood so well. I think part of the issue is like obviously the, the, the history of Australia uh, in terms of Indigenous peoples. Uh, 
probably not favorable towards, uh, you know, some of that information being handed on, but also the fact that indigenous people, their, their groups, their tribal groups were so small and, uh, you know, contextually bound, you know, like uh, New South Wales uh, indigenous people in Queensland, indigenous people were completely different. The way they speak, their languages were different, their, the way they uh, rotated and moved and all of that was all different. And uh, so you can see how it kind of got lost, particularly with an oral tradition as well. But um, definitely. What's a couple of examples you can think of like bush food, like where you, you possibly could see like a wider or broader application, um, you know, maybe being more of a mainstream sort of plate or table food? I think one to look out for, especially for us spears, is um, pig face. You'll see it all over beaches. It's a succulent that lives in the sand dunes. Okay. Uh, it's one of the first. It's super easy to identify and there's nothing that really looks like it. So it's a really easy one to get involved with. Um, it'll live on the sand dunes just behind the beach. And it usually holds the sand dunes together, actually. Uh-huh. Um, and to be honest, I've never had issues eating it, whether it's in a built-up area or not. You probably don't want to eat it if it's next to a lagoon. Unfortunately, like lagoons in built-up areas, like where I live on the northern beaches, I wouldn't really eat food from them. But if you are lucky enough to live away from big cities and industrial areas, um, I've eaten things like tampon and stuff like that as well. But pig face is awesome. It's like a salty strawberry. Okay. Oh, wow. Yeah. So have a look at that. Google some images and then, um, yeah, pretty easy to identify. It has like a little pink uh, fruit on it that grows under where the flower was. Uh, starts out to... green and turns pink around this time of year, actually. I'm going to try and link up a, uh, an image to that in today's show. It's at noobspirit.com forward slash bollin. Perfect like pollen, but with a B and then uh, people can all have a look at it. So pig face, uh, an interesting succulent. Is it predominantly, do you know where we, where it can be found? Is it predominantly New South Wales or is it? I've, I've found it all across New South Wales. Um, but uh, my understanding it grows on the East coast of Australia, um, and potentially across the rest of Australia as well. But yeah. unfortunately, yeah, probably more, uh, more only in Australia. Okay, cool. That's where my experience is. Yeah, all good, man. Um, it's interesting digging into local secrets and tips and stuff. Like some of it's broadly applicable and some of it's not, but it's there are interesting things that Spiro sort of get lost in uh, rabbit holes, as you mentioned earlier. Rabbit holes, that's it, mate. Learn from the best. Adam Stern's courses at freedivingfamily.com are written and presented by some of the world's best freedivers and most experienced instructors. Lessons learned come from years of freediving and teaching at the highest levels and are now condensed and available for everyone. Go to freedivingfamily.com, use the code SPIRO and you get 20% off any course. Now there's Frenzel, Advanced Frenzel, Hands Free Equalization, there's Mouthful and Deep Frenzel Equalization, even by finning Essentials. Get that finning technique right. It's the one percenters that make the difference in spearing and allow you to have more time on the bottom and you feel better even doing it. Go to freedivingfamily.com and use the code SPIRO to get 20% off any course. Adam Stern's courses at freedivingfamily.com. The Fishing Trips app allows you to find new people who are interested in going spearfishing. So you can go for a trip together. It's a great way to make friends and get some extra trips. If you are looking to get out on boats, if you're in an isolated part of the area where you don't have a spearfishing club and you still want to find a dive buddy and dive safer and smarter, download the Fishing Trips app. It's available on iOS or Android. Download it today. The Fishing Trips app will help you connect with your next best spearfishing buddy. Fishing Trips app. Download on iOS or Android today. In the world of freedive spearfishing, there's no magic breathing technique that's all of a sudden going to get you down and shoot massive fish at depth and holding big bottom times. But there is a way to do it safer and smarter, take down more fuel to maximise the time that you have there. Learn at noobspiro.com forward slash TED with Ted Hardy from Immersion Freediving. If you take down more fuel, you can stay for longer. Learning to take a bigger breath is not such a big deal. Ted breaks it down for you with a free online course at noobspiro.com forward slash Ted. Take down 20 to 30% more air just by learning how to take a full breath. Again, learn how to do it free at noobspiro.com forward slash Ted. Man, so, I mean, you got into spearfishing 2019. What's one of the first sort of fish that was memorable for you, like that you shot, hunted, took home and ate? I think one of the first fish, 
is probably just the first fish I shot. Um, it was a horseshoe leather jacket. And that was when I had just come back from the UK. Hadn't invested in any gear or anything. I was wearing a surf wetsuit and like a mesh weight belt with weights that weren't the right weights for me and a snorkel, like a clear, like cheapo toy shop snorkel and a, and a pole spear. And I just never pictured myself shooting any fish with that pole spear. And when I did hit a leather jacket, which I now know is you can pretty much touch them with your hands. Um, But it definitely opened my eyes to being able to eat things that I caught or that I'm involved in the whole process of. How good a leather jacket to eat though? I love them. I love them too. I love them. I've, I've started to steer away from some of the other species we get around here, like black brake jacket and um, horseshoe and stuff. I don't shoot so many horseshoe anymore. But definitely six spine leather jacket, uh, some of the most impressive and tastiest fish I've ever eaten. Why, are you, why are you steering clear of some of them now? Um, I steer clear of a few fish now that I did used to shoot a lot because they're so, they are abundant in – the northern beaches but things like drama ludwig that kind of stuff unless you're if i was hungry i would be shooting them but they do have quite a weedy taste to them Mm. Uh, they are weed eaters so there's not a massive way to avoid that like things like drama and stuff i'll use if i'm doing fish tacos because there is so much meat on them they're a beautiful fish for that Mm. but i've just found with cooking fillets and things like that it's just not my cup of tea yeah. Um I like I'm happy to eat other things. Um I don't I'm not going hungry, you know. If I was then it might be a different story. How bad are drummer and lutterick when you don't gut them and then you get home and you have to do it in your sink or something like that and you pop Drummer them. especially. Oh, yeah. I don't know I don't know any other fish to make such a mess when you open oh, them up. Terrible. Terrible. Um yeah. they lend well to smoking though, as do a lot of fish. Drummer. Right? Yeah, and I know, well, beautiful. I, yeah, and I, and I think you've taken to smoking fairly recently. Is that right? I have been. Yeah, I have been. So we spoke about the smoky ramen before. Um, yeah, for my birthday this year, I built myself a smoker out of an old um, acetone barrel. Okay. It's only a small one, but um, cooked a couple of briskets and sort of got a bit of a taste for it. It sort of it goes with a lot of things that are sort of same like the bushcraft kind of stuff of having to prepare the wood and the smoking I was doing was all over uh, logs and things like that. Okay. And I sort of, I love that whole thing. It's it's a lot of work, but you're spending hours at a smoker, slowly feeding it little bits of timber and that kind of thing. But at at the end of the day, when you've got a piece of, or some food that you can especially feed to other people and you spend hours like sort of caring for and taking like your time with, it's, it's really nice. Really nice. Your start to smoking fish is fairly non-typical. <laughs> sounds, yeah. pretty, sounds pretty ambitious to build your own smoker and, and have a crack at it. Um, if another person, like, hits you up on Instagram or something, they're like, hey, Josh, like, see you smoking heaps of fish. Um, how can I get started doing that? What, what would sort of be your, like, you know, like 30-second, 60-second explanation of how to, how to have a good crack at it? Um, I'm not sure how much they cost, but I have seen little small, um, metal containers and you sort of, you put them over a little firebox. So you don't have to, you don't have to learn welding and cutting open barrels and things like I did, but, um, yeah, that kind of thing. Uh, have a look around online. There's some little compact like travel sort of smokers that work quite well. I've seen people use them. Yeah. Um, it doesn't take too much to learn how to use those, which is awesome. So um, your smoker, it must be fairly versatile if you can do like big slabs of like beef and then also fish as well. Are you able to control the temperature and the, um, the airflow? Um, not so well. So it was a largely an experiment when I did it, the first brisket. Um, uh, lucky we got two, uh, two small briskets, like two three kilo ones rather than one big seven kilo one. Um, so I think they ended up giving us a point and a cup, um, and we had two smokers going then. So it, it's pretty difficult to control the temperature the way I'm doing it. I had a lot of problems when we first started, but slowly sort of got the hang of it. And 
I definitely want to put at the moment it's just the barrel, but I want to have the barrel and then set up with a little offset. So I think I'm going to get a little jerry can from somewhere and strip the paint off that and do a burnout in it. And then I can have the fire actually separate from the smoker itself. Because at the moment, there's just a fire in one end and then my mate or whatever it is goes at the other end and it's just the smoke sort of collects inside the barrel. Okay. And have you got a chimney? How do you regulate the airflow? Just by opening it and closing it a little bit? Just let it go. Let it do its thing. <laughs> I, think, I think a lot of people get super into it and I understand the rabbit hole of yeah. smoking. And I understand that and I can appreciate that. But for me, it's, if it's cooked and you didn't like completely burn it, and it tastes like smoke. I'm pretty happy. So love it. I'm. I might be sounding like an expert here. I'm just trying to ask good questions because I haven't actually invested in a smoker myself. Like where I'm sitting, kind of in a six pack of flats. Uh, mm. I can imagine how uh, how popular I'd be with the neighbours having a big smoker cranked up on my bank on my bal- on my balcony. But yeah. I had a mate who was doing a fair bit of it. He bought a he bought a decent one from Aldi. Like Aldi have a oh, yeah? annual special and they sell one and it's gas and uh, they look bloody magic. But I also hear about them on Joe Rogan all the time with the big Traeger ones. They got pallet feeders and all sorts of stuff. Yeah. It's um, but there's something to be said for just doing it yourself. I think so. That's that's the thing. As long as you're having fun and enjoying it, and if the rabbit hole is your thing, by all means, go down it. Have a geezer like. Spend your time doing something you love and keep learning. That's like that's my whole thing is go down that rabbit hole, just keep learning, keep yourself busy, keep your feet moving and your brain moving. The biggest thing for me with smoked fish is not so much the, the art and the method of it. It's the taste of smoked fish. I friggin' love it. Mm. It's I'm actually yet to try it, but if you're saying that drum is quite good, I might have to give it a go. Yeah, I think any any um sort of fairly moist fillet fish. But I, again, I'm a bit of an amateur. I love Spanish mackerel on them. Um, some of the best yeah. food eaten. But um, in New Zealand, we had kawai, um, Australian uh, salmon go good. Um, yeah. yeah, I think bait fish lend well to it. Um, I'm, but I don't know. Like again, I'm only at the entry to the rabbit hole. I have there yet we go. To lay down. It, so, but I'm so sure on the rabbit hole. Yeah, that's it. I think um, yeah, definitely something I want to try. But mm. I'd very interesting cold smoking as well so hopefully with this whole idea i've got of building the offset to the portion of it i can involve some tubing to make some cold smoking happen because hey, right, eh? i reckon that'd be very nice yeah cool all right well let us know how your experiments go and as usual if you ever write an article or anything nobespero.com is always going to be happy to have it buddy so uh, right, thank you <laughs> thank you for making me work trick <laughs> <laughs> always appreciate that uh, um, in terms of like uh, scary stuff, like stuff that's made you sort of go ooh and and really learn in the ocean, because um, I think we all have a lot of those moments. Like, um, uh, what's been something memorable for you? I'm pretty lucky. I haven't had any big scares. Um, I know a few guys who had blackouts and things like that, and that's always in the back of your mind. It's always sort of something you worry about. You do forget about it sometimes when the vis is good and you're chasing fish and everything like that and you get a bit distracted but for the most part it's just some of the usual runnings with sharks and things like that i'm still getting my head around like being in the water with sharks um if i'm on the surface and i can see them i'm pretty fine but there's been a couple of times recently when uh when the water first started warming up here in sydney the uh the little juvenile bronzy started coming back and I had a pair of them coming at me when I was sitting at about 12 meters. And that, that really sort of, you know, I needed a wetsuit change after that. Um, but yeah, I, so I came back to the surface and sort of calmed down and realized, okay, they're just there. But they, they left me quick as well. A lot of the whaler species seem to play an intimidation game. And um, when a shark gets over, like, I don't know, I don't know what that magic number is. Maybe it's five or six feet or something like that. They, that when they when they're all their body language is all postured up, um, and they're starting to buzz you, and it seems mm. like bronzies like to do that. They are a bloody intimidating animal. Definitely, I've seen a few boys been posting photos of some bigger ones recently. They've seen out off the northern beaches, and they sort of they start to get almost like a bull shark kind of look about it, with that like the big hump on the back and stuff, and they sort of yeah get a bit caught up when you don't see them so often and you haven't really seen them much before. Yeah, yeah. 
Or if you um, do repeated drops and see them each drop, then it starts to be like, oh, shit. And uh, yeah, it ruins your breath, though, doesn't it? Definitely. There's been a few. Uh, I think uh, Luke Potts from Aquatic Rehab posted, um, there was a video he did a little while ago of a touch of reef on a pinnacle and it was just covered in bronze arrows. And I was just, I, and his mate, um, who's an amputee, he's just diving with them, loving it, shooting fish around them, like, yeah. just in. I was, I was shocked, like, so much, like, appreciation for those guys, or at least respect for them doing that kind of Yeah, I think sometimes, like, you can um, get acclimatised to um, different risks and you, you mm. sort of become almost like uh, what causes other people a lot of fear and anxiety, you sort of become accustomed to. It's almost like that. Yeah, good point. For you, um, in the Sydney area, Northern Beaches, what's one of your favourite species to hunt and how do you do it effectively? Um, hunting still something I'm sort of learning a lot. I'm, I think I have an awareness about how it's supposed to work, but the uh, application of that I think is still what I'm working on. Especially like we were sort of saying before, I've been out of the water for a little bit recently with the dirty water and the working and all that kind of thing. When you get back in, it's, there's a lot to think about um, in terms of getting your head back into that. And for me, my favorite fish to hunt recently has been like goatfish. We have these little black spot goatfish around. Mm. And um, the little ones don't seem to mind you too much, but there's definitely a, like you'll find the bigger ones can be a little bit flighty they'll see you coming sometimes on a dive if it's not quite perfect or whatever so you really have to get on their level but really been enjoying sort of finding them on sand patches you'll find a little school of them and you've got a bit of kelp in front of you and you can come down and like crawl up through the kelp just to like the edge of the sand patch and just try and take your shot from there yeah and it's been been really cool learning how to do that so sort of you're getting on a level you're using cover and then because you're on a level with them, you've got the best sort of like um, uh, sort of fish profile to offer you the best target as well, I guess, as well. And then uh, do they respond differently to you because you're on a level with them? Um, definitely. I don't seem to mind you so much. And if you sort of slowly make your way uh, out of the kelp, they sort of they don't spook as much as if you're just sort of diving down onto the sand patch that they're on. Yeah. Um, they might sort of like be a bit wary, but they'll sort of come around a little bit more, which is always, it's always nice to like be able to interact with nature and have it not be scared of you and to sort of be a part of what's going on in that ecosystem. They seem to be a fish that sort of um, forages like in and amongst like maybe the algae off rocks or something. Is that kind of what you would think they're feeding on or have you got any? Um, better? They got a weird those weird shaped things off their face and stuff and their coloration. Yeah. Different. They've got um two barbells under their chin or um, I think they're called barbells under their chin. Mm. Uh, and my understanding is they forage in sand. You can find them around rocks and stuff a bit. Um, but for the most part, they feed in little sandy patches and the bigger ones, especially will eat crabs and little crustaceans. Okay. And I, I managed to shoot, um, a uh, pretty decent one recently, actually, which was uh, super privileged. Um, but that one, I dry age a lot of my fish. Um, yeah. I hang it in the fridge, um, and I found that's like the best way to store fish. I've I've had fish in there for seven to nine days, unless you're freezing. Seven to nine days, and they turn out awesome, and they dry out a little bit. They're not too like uh, not too much liquid coming out of them. But that big goldfish under its skin, it had all this orange oil yep. and when I took my knife through that oil was all collecting on the knife and I could just scrape my knife along the skin it would pick up all this orange fat and that fat tasted like crab oh wow. it was shocking to me like how distinct that flavor was and yeah. then I'd tend to try and make ramens and stocks out of all of my fish frames at least all the clean ones things like drummer more long all that kind of stuff I don't particularly just because of the the, the stock is going to bring out a lot of flavors in the fish and in the bones. And um, you try not to put the blood, the bloody parts in. Unfortunately, you can't really use them. Yep. Um, but it was pretty crazy. And that, that stock I made from that goat fish was to this day, probably one of my favorites. Yeah. Right. So, okay. So a couple of questions like um, hanging 
dead fish up in your refrigerator at home. Uh, I think that would make my fiance and most other people's partners insane. Um, does it taint everything else in the refrigerator? What do you do with the excess moisture that wicks off the fish? And um, do you have a separate refrigerator for this? Uh, I do. I'm super lucky. We have a beer fridge in the garage and that fridge is pretty weathered these days. So no one really minds it being, it's sort of the, it's the overflow, overflow fridge. Okay. So it has a lot of pickles and beers and that kind of stuff in it. And I think everyone in my house has uh, luckily become accustomed to it. I don't know if like a stranger would come, they might be a bit shocked by it, especially when there are a few fish hanging in there. Yeah. But for the most part, it doesn't particularly smell. It definitely has, it's not like a clean fridge, but it doesn't smell rancid. It doesn't smell off or bad. It just has a smell to it. Yeah. It's not particularly bad in my opinion what about um the moisture from the fish does um do they drip for like a couple of days when you first put them yeah they they definitely do i used to hang the fish uh, i've made little hooks out of coat hangers and i used to hang them from uh from the head uh which worked quite well but in i sort of felt like it didn't give any excess liquid away to come off yeah so i started hanging them from the tail end which people like josh nyland and um there's a guy on instagram called dry edge fish guy those guys are super lucky, lucky enough to be able to use quite expensive dry aging fridges that actually cool the air in the fridge in a completely different way. That's not blowing cold air. It's a cooling element inside the fridge. Okay. Um, but in my fridge, I hang the fish upside down. And it allows the excess liquid to drop off. And I have a little tray in the bottom that collects. And every now and then, or each, each time I sort of empty out the fridge, I'll clean that out. Mm. And it helps to sort of keep things clean in there. Oh, yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah, right. I was thinking almost like having like spill kit type um, pad yeah. in the bottom or something to soak it up, but a tray sounds better because you just wash it out and put it back. Um, mm. In terms of the, the the roof of the fridge, um, I've got an idea of these coat hanger type things. Now I'm sort of thinking like, oh, I'm thinking if I was going to do it, I'd probably have like slip knot type strings hanging off some sort of hanger system. And then you could adjust it to base to get around the tail of the fish. But how do you attach them to the roof of the thing? Have you made like a, a wire frame or something? like? Yeah, so the fridge has racks in it, yep. sort of as a normal fridge would. It, I think um, older fridges maybe more so, instead of the, the glass shelves or the perfect shelves, they've got like wire racks. Yeah. So I just um, get the hook and I've like sharpened the ends of them and that can go through the tail of the fish and then right. hook up onto uh, the rack itself. But I think you got a good point about the string. I haven't actually tried that. I think um, it might actually work a little bit better, so I might give that a go. I maybe just saw a picture of someone else doing it. That's why it's stuck in my head. But um, I think a few people, I think Valentine Thomas has started dry aging fish as well. I think a lot of those guys do with string. Mm. Um, I, I think it might be a better better way, actually, because I do have a lot of problems with the hooks ripping out sometimes. Yeah, I mean, I can imagine the the, the skin on the tails would deteriorate after a couple of days. but. And some of them it are actually it, quite it toughens up. It oh, okay. dries out. Yeah. So that's the thing. I think a few people have messaged me um, over time about dry aging, um, just because I've posted a bit about it. Um, I don't dry age fillets. I just dry age whole fish, either scaled or with scales on. Yeah. Because that allows the fish, the meat, to not dry out. Because any exposed meat will dry out. Okay. And become like jerky. The way I did it, I just had to play with a surgeon fish because it's not scales either. So I thought, oh, this mm. um, I left the skin on, filleted it, threw the rest of the fish away, to be honest. And then I just, mm. um, I didn't introduce any fresh water. I just pat dried the fillets and then I wrapped them in paper towels, put them in a Ziploc, um, just normal bag, like a lunch bag, put that in the fridge. And then I think it was like 36 or 48 hours later, I changed the paper towel. And then another 24 hours later, I pulled it out and I made, um, the best ceviche I've ever eaten in my life, which um, awesome. that recipe actually made it into the book. I, I called it Shrek, awesome. Shrek Viche. Um, <laughs> and that, that works for me, though. but that's really, to be honest, that's my first exposure to dry aging. And I've looked at some of the more advanced techniques. I just wanted a real simple sort of entry point for myself to try out. And it worked like just unbelievably well, like some of the best fish I've eaten. Like, um, so... Rival sauce. I'm keen to uh, have a look at that recipe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, 
but that that is that's a good point that's uh sushi chef uh i did talk to a little while ago he mentioned that if you're wanting to do fillets or lines instead of a whole fish mm. the best way to do it is to wrap it in paper towel and paper towel is your best friend when you're prepping fish i think as you mentioned before um no introducing fresh water fresh water is gonna uh if you're going to eat it straight away, it's not the worst thing in the world. But definitely if you're trying to keep fish for a while, fresh water is just going to make it go off way quicker. Yep. Um, but you want to touch with paper towel, especially as nice as it is to use eco recycled paper towel. A lot of the time it's super thin and not really good quality. So you want to use tough, sturdy paper towel, dry it down, wrap it up. And like you said, Ziploc or my friend mentioned uh, cling wrap, just super tight around the fish oh, God, yeah. and then changing that every day or two. Yep. But yeah, not the most eco-friendly, but that is the best way I've experienced to take care of your catch. Sometimes I think if people are honest, like most of the decisions we make in, in, in life involve cost, environmental costs, like actual monetary costs, time cost, all the rest of it. Sometimes I think, we like to try and oversimplify things. All plastic is evil and bad and mm. paper towel kills trees and all the rest of it. Sometimes it's like, we just got to have a little bit of maturity about it. It's like, is it worth um, potentially keeping a fish for six or seven days? Um, or am I going to allow this fish to go off in 24 hours? Cause I don't want to use plastic. It's mm. kind of like, what's the more ethical decision to make? I, I think life's full of those ethical dilemmas and, as long as you're thoughtful and intentional about it, I mean, that's about all anyone can do, isn't it? Exactly. I think you had a really interesting conversation with Lisa Ferrier the other day. Yeah. Um, about a lot of this sort of stuff of like ethics and environmentalism and the sort of a lot of people falling into ideological traps, in my opinion, of joining a team rather than sort of having a perspective that's quite broad and sort of having your own values and things like if you don't want to eat meat it is what it is but you can't deny the fact that your lifestyle is always going to have an impact in some way you might be taking care of your lifestyle or like you're impacting one way but in a completely other way you're damaging things way worse than other people yeah. and people sort of get lost in that and sort of yeah try and put people down for certain things but like you said like potentially the offset of catching your own food offsets the fact that you're eating food that's imported from another country on a boat. It takes so many emissions to come to your plate mm. opposed to you just using a paper towel that isn't recycled. Yeah. 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 It's good. It's good. Um, I'm glad you listened to that. She's, she was bloody awesome. So yeah. Talking about shit hot recipes though, uh, yeah. 99 spare recipes, you've submitted a whole bunch and, uh, Photography scores up the wazoo. Some of these recipes are fantastic. Some of them are fairly simple, which is great, which is, you know, what I was hoping for. And some of them are a bit more advanced. So you've, you've put in a good, um, a good sort of volley of them. I've got campfire mussels, coastal okonomiyaki, lobster oil, octopus dumplings, or tak tak takoyaki, I think it's. Tako takoyaki and okonomiyaki. Yeah. Oh, okay. I've been to Japan too, and I still butcher the hell out of that. <laughs> paella, which I'm butchering as well, or paella. If, uh, paella. How do you say um, samp samphire fish? What's that one? Samphire. So we sort of mentioned, I mentioned briefly before samphire, it's sort of, it goes around lagoons and estuaries and things like that. It's like a salty asparagus in a way. Um, okay. And when you saute that or grill it, it has this, yeah, awesome salty asparagusy kind of flavor that goes quite well with uh with fish to be honest, which is awesome because it comes from a pretty similar environment to those fish. I got six spine ravioli, uh, a tuna burger, uni toast, which I wanted to chat with you about, a yellowtail katsu sando, or some, I'm butchering all of this, Josh. Sorry about it, mate. <laughs> You're all good, mate. Um, let's talk about some of these recipes. So, um, mm. octopus uh, is definitely something that intimidates a lot of people. Is it? Uh, rubber uh, and uh, it seems to be fairly easy to overcook as well. Um, Definitely. I'd love for you to chat about octopus. How can we be less intimidated cooking octopus? Um, it, it's a tricky one. Uh, I think because it is so easy to sort of prepare wrong. And um, I think if you 
want to really have a look at that, have a look at people like Kimmy Werner and stuff who are in Hawaii. The Hawaiians love their octopus, or taco, I think they call it. Yeah. Um, some of them, I believe, even have a separate washing machine um, for tenderizing their octopus. So they'll just put octopus in that and that's their tenderizer. Um, that's the biggest thing with octopus is you've got to tenderize it. Um, and whether you are going to do it the sort of Japanese way and spend, I don't know, 40 minutes massaging the octopus with salt, or like coarse salts or taro or whatever it might be, um, or you're going to do it like maybe it's more sort of Greek culture and you're going to just slap it on the rocks or whatever, uh, it kind of does need to be done. I find if you want to sort of get around that, um, cooking it just on coals or over a barbecue, just grilling it straight up. Um, if you don't mind sort of squishy things, I think mean, you're always going to struggle with texture issues with octopus. Yeah. Um, but another good one I saw recently actually was, you know, like the Sarah gun, like the massage gun. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. And they sort of have that point on them that goes back yeah. and forth. I was a sushi chef and he said, we used to spend 40 minutes per tentacle massaging the octopus. And he goes, no, I just spend five minutes. And he gets a Ziploc bag and just starts saying on the octopus tentacles. <laughs> Which is, I still yet to try that. I'm pretty keen to try that. That's true. But I think the takoyaki is a good one because it it removes people's sort of, um, as much as you want to connect with your food, it, you're cutting it up into small pieces. So it's becoming a part of a bigger thing and it's not so much that you're chewing on big pieces of octopus. It's actually spread through the octopus ball or dumpling, whatever you want to call it. I love octopus. I freaking love it. I like them it's as beautiful. Animals, and I like eating them. I don't know if that's wrong, mm. but it's just what I do. <laughs> that's yeah. I you mentioned as well, I think recently about the Mark Octopus Teacher documentary. Mm. Um there's an interesting one. I think same with the same for Sea Spiracy and things like that. Documentaries are always gonna be skewed and trying to push an idea and stuff, which is all well and good, but for a lot of people that's their introduction to that thing mm. their introduction to that and they don't get to a sort of understand it or learn it for themselves it's this perspective that's just given to them and presented to them mm. Mm. and it's quite interesting like being able to, yeah, to observe octopus and see how playful they are whether whether you spend 365 days with an octopus or not an octopus is usually quite playful and they're quite inquisitive because they want to learn they want to they only live for a short time, so they've evolved to be inquisitive so that they can learn how to exist in that short period of time. Yeah, and they're incredible. There's nothing else like them, you know. They change Beautiful cult- creatures. their behavior in terms of, like, uh, adapting and doing crazy stuff to uh, avoid predation. Like, that's super interesting animals. Um, Definitely. Also super tasty, whether you do it Greek or oh, Spanish. You can't avoid that. Japanese you can't avoid wine. that. Yeah, yeah. Um, cool, man. Um, yeah, some awesome recipes you've submitted. So thanks for that, man. Uh, really appreciate you. and your involvement in this project. It's been um, it's bloody awesome. I'm s- sometimes I look at I look at the the diversity of recipes and the people that have submitted um, recipes, and I'm just super stoked. Like uh, it's just bloody awesome. I'm really looking forward to this thing going out and being live. So it'd be cool. Shrek, my dude, you're killing it on the Noob Spiro podcast. Every guest you get on frosts on the spearing life and the actionable info is off the chain. Over here at Spearing Magazine HQ, it's the same, buddy. So many Noobers are submitting their adventures, lessons learned, and pictures here at spearingmagazine.com. Just wanted to say that uh, Noobers can get an international subscription here at spearingmagazine.com. They can also check out our In the Face Apparel or get a subscription to the world's greatest spearing magazine. Check it out at spearingmagazine.com. Shrek, thanks. Love what you're doing. Jeremy out. Killfish with precision and power, sending shafts from a stable platform with Killshot spear guns. Made in the Florida Keys by Ed Martin, you're buying American made dependable spear guns. Get $30 off any Killshot spear gun at Killshot Spear Guns. Dot com. Yes and amen, Nuba. That's $30 off American-made performance spear guns at killshotspearguns.com. It says if they're in the shop or on the phone, they can cash in by saying, crikey, mate, or the Noob Spiro podcast sent me. Check them out at killshotspearguns.com, based in the Florida Keys. Equalizing problems can be something that derail you. 
Not today, my friend. Go to freedivingfamily.com. Check out the, either the Friends and Advanced Friends or video or the Mouthful and Deep Friends or Equalization course at freedivingfamily.com. You can use the code SPIRO to get 20% off any course at freedivingfamily.com. These courses are put together by Adam Stern and a select team of, of, of legends and to help you overcome different issues and help you perform better. And some of them are extremely relevant for freedive spearing. Check it out at freedivingfamily.com. Use the code SPIRO to get 20% off any course. Moving on though, uh, we, we, we were going to get into a deep dive chatting about anxiety, um, I believe. You wanted, to, mm. you wanted to talk about that? Um, yeah, I think the anxiety part's always definitely been a thing for me. It's sort of, there's a, especially when you haven't been in the water for a little while or when you first start out, there's a sort of anticipation of being in the water. You don't really know what the condition is going to be like until you actually put your head under the water. Mm. Uh, you can sort of you can you can tell, and as you start to learn about the sport more, you can tend to pick things a little bit better. But you still never really know. It always surprises you. Could have a subtly swell that usually means there's clear water, but for some reason on that day there isn't. Um, I think like Tim Casaman talks about fear and all that kind of stuff. Fear was a massive thing for me starting because uh, some of the spots we dive, you're climbing down rock cliffs, you're climbing down a rope chain that's put there by fishermen however long ago or whatever, it's kind of rusted and everything else. But you're climbing down that to get onto a rock ledge to jump off where there's no people around. There's no one there. No one's really coming to help you, which I think is when it's important to have your mates there. Um, but it taught me a lot in terms of just pushing into fear and anxiety and not always just thinking that that was the tr- the true reality of what was going on because so often you have this anticipation or this fear or anxiety about going for a dive and you jump in and then the next thing you know it's four hours later and you haven't eaten you haven't had any water but you don't really care because you're coming home with some fish to eat yeah and you, you had the best day ever you swam with a school of 200 cow nose rays or you saw some insane fish or whatever it might be it sort of opens your eyes and makes you realize that sometimes you've got to push into that that feeling um to sort of let that feeling know what's up i always think of it as like riding like riding a horse or something it's like because sometimes fear and anxiety can be like overwhelming you know like I don't know if you can relate, but like I've had moments where I'm in the ocean and it's like a washing machine and you can't see because of um, bubbles in the water and just mm. swell moving up and down. You're in a washing machine and then, you you know, like you've got a mask that's fogging up on you. You're trying to hold on to this spear gun that's tied to a float that's being dragged into the waves 20 metres behind you. Um, yeah. And you're just trying to get into some form of place where you can like be rational, make good decisions and do the, and do the right thing. Cause if, if fear overwhelms you during those times, you can make bad decisions that will hurt you. And it's, it seems to be sometimes it's that internal battle, but it's a, it's a hard one. Like Mm. what do you do? What's your process? I think I definitely know what you mean in that sort of situation. Um, I, I feel quite comfortable in the water. I'm really lucky. I've always grown up going to the beach and growing up in the surf. And I've always had those moments where you sort of, you do panic and stuff, especially when you're surfing um, or swimming in the surf and a wave does hold you down. That's quite um, terrifying when that happens and you realize the sort of force and power of it all. Mm. Um, Spear fishing and stuff definitely helped me with the sort of, the swell side of things um, in terms of well, free diving, essentially the more the swell side of things and surfing and that and being held under. Um, but just staying calm and like not being in a rush. I think just generally just slowing down is such a, such a good piece of advice for anyone starting. And I think it's so many people talking about just slow down, slow down, slow down. Because when you're in those situations, when you're trying to get back up onto the rocks and there's, set after set after set coming and you don't know how you're going to get back on and you don't know how you're going to get back onto land that can get overwhelming and yeah. it can freak you out a bit. But sometimes you just got to sort of stop and just swim a bit further out, let yourself calm down and then sort of come back to it and pick your moment and don't 
rush that moment to sort of get out of the water. I think that would be the biggest situation for me where I sort of feel that. And I've had been with mates definitely who lost a lot of gear, unfortunately, like pretty much their whole kit because like I might have gone the first and then they're waiting out and they've just sort of rushed in behind me rather than picking their time in between sets or whatever it might be. Um, and yeah, it can definitely get overwhelming though when you're in those situations. So always slow down and don't don't be worried to sort of just swim out. Usually in swell, you'll be all right. If the water's a bit more open, you're not getting pushed up against the rocks. Mm. So I don't know if that's helpful, but that's what I do. That's what I find. Yeah, you know, it's good. Internal self-talk is something that comes to mind. But then I was just thinking before, like you were saying, like you've got to tell yourself, calm down. And I was just picturing like when some of my loved ones like become very frustrated or angry with the situation and I say those magic words, just calm down. Um, yeah. It doesn't seem to have that effect on them. Um, no, do maybe you... more so just stopping. Just yeah. kind of... And it's hard to have that awareness. That, that, is, that is the struggle. It's hard to have that awareness when you're in that situation. Do you have any sort of self-talk lines? Because, like, I've talked to, you know, freedivers and 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 even in the mindfulness, sort of the yoga, we, uh, some of the – there's some weird sort of – okay, I'm not I'm – sorry, I don't mean to label it. Uh, like, you can get a, these hyper-spiritual mindfulness type people. A lot of them have these mantras and stuff. Uh, yeah. Have Definitely. you got self-talk that you use? Like, is there any specific lines or anything like that? Or is it just... Um, not so much specific lines. Um, I think I definitely have a lot of self-talk. I like talking to myself all the time. Not necessarily out loud, but definitely in my head, sort of deliberating, analysing, and trying to figure things out in my own head. Mm. Um, but definitely that... Yeah, I think it's important. I, meditating is definitely something I've lacked on recently. And you, I think you notice that in your diving when you're sort of, you can't, you don't have as much control, I guess, over yourself in that way. Like yeah. control always sometimes gets looked down on, but to have that control over your own fears, your anxieties, your feelings and all that kind of stuff, or at least be able to observe them to separate yourself from them. Um, but definitely sort of trying to, yeah, have a calm perspective. When you feel yourself starting to get really worked up to be able to sort of go, stop, breathe, don't rush, it's all good. Like, slow yeah. down. Yeah, it doesn't have to be super, like, involved or anything. It's just got to be, like, this clear language. And you've got to realise, like, um, I think when you do mindfulness or any of these com- co- uh, uh, conscious sort of self-talk exercises, like, like for a long time I did Headspace. I did the Headspace mm. app for about a year during some real difficult parts of my life. And I really enjoyed the opportunity to just sit back and watch the crazy shit going on in my mind and be able to put a bit of distance between that and then be okay with it. And I think Mm. anxiety in these heightened situations, like when you have that level of conscious uh, control, I guess, well, it's not really control though. It's just conscious awareness. You, You can rationalize your way through it. You can find a way. Is that, can you relate to that? I think so. I think so. I was thinking like the same way we try and hunt and stalk fish in terms of observing them and not sort of aggressively pursuing them or trying to control that fish's behavior so that it will come quite like we do control it in a way so it will come closer, but you're not trying to chase it. You're not trying to force a moment to happen with that fish. Mm. You sort of want to be able to achieve that with yourself to be able to sit there and watch yourself and not force things or control things, but just to go, okay, this is what's happening. What are we going to do about it? And sort of work your way through it, as you said, in like a rational way. More like the uh, the composer of an orchestra rather than like uh, the drummer from Def Leppard or something. <laughs> Hitting that double bass. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes our minds feel like that. I think one of the delightful things about spearfishing is, is like um, there's a reason for your anxiety. Like there's shit, yeah. there's spearfishing, there's shit that'll actually kill you. When you're in regular like, life, a lot of the stuff we're anxious about and worried about, it has no real threat to us. But there's yeah. a level of like anxiety that just seems unreasonable at times. I, f- I feel like spearfishing sometimes just gives you a chance to reset. I think I uh, did have a pretty interesting conversation with my mom about this recently. And uh, it's, I was really interested in psychology and counseling and all that kind of thing. So she sort of is interested to what, like to see what I find from it all. 
and to sort of explain it to her as a meditation, that kind of thing. But for a lot of people, we do have these anxieties and fears and these this sort of feelings and energy in our body that um, I think some people talk about in terms of we used to be chased by tigers, but now we like catch the bus to work and stuff, you know? Yeah, yeah. So I think a lot of the time for a lot of people, these feelings of being out of control or anxiety, fear, stress, all that kind of stuff is innate. Whether you're sitting on the couch or whether you're working in an office, there's potential that you're going to be feeling these things. And um, doing stuff like spearfishing, I think, gives, at least for me, in my experience, it gives those feelings inside me a place to exist in my life that makes sense. Mm. So those feelings are always going to be a part of me. They're always going to be happening and stuff. But if I just sit on the couch or if I just go to work and come home and don't do a whole lot, they're going to be there and it's not going to make sense. It's not going to, it's just going to be bubbling away, coming and going with no real, uh, allowing me no real sort of understanding or control, I guess, in a way of it. But if I can go spearing and put myself in potentially more risky situations or situations where those feelings are applicable and completely reasonable, Mm. it sort of helps me manage the rest of my life to not have that going on. Mm. Because in a way, those feelings kind of help you. That anxiety makes you hyper aware maybe or the stress, the fear, like it is useful and it makes sense in that environment. I think it just runs counter to a lot of the orthodoxy that, you know, our society and the dominant zeitgeist makes us privy to. And the fact it's like, you know, we, we exist in a world where everything is designed to make us comfortable and make our lives easier, um, supposedly make us healthier. And I think without having places in your life for discomfort, um, exposure to a, a, a higher level of risk, um, yeah, like it's like we're not actually doing ourselves any favor by living lives like that, lives of comfort. They no. they lack no. meaning, they lack excitement, and they lack, I don't know, just like, you know, like just, I don't know, it's like good stuff for your soul, you know, like going out yeah. to fishing. It's just like you come back, you feel alive, whether you sometimes whether you yeah. fish or not. Um, this, I mean, yeah, and then you add the social side into it. Definitely. It's been super valuable getting ready for this because I sort of, I was getting ready and I was like, I feel sad on my death. Like I'm, I'm, I'm definitely on the noob end of the sphere I've seen here. Like, I don't know what I'm going to be talking about, but going back over my photos and things and looking at what I have done with spearfishing and just adventure and travel over the last two years, how much I've grown. Mm. Um, and a big thing that sort of I realized today was, it, that stuff makes us human. That stuff, like, we've only been living these lives for, I don't know, even the last 100 years. Like, not even. Like, my grandparents were so involved in their food, so involved in, mm. like, living. But now we have so much free time and so much freedom that I think I see it in a lot of my peers and stuff. There's this struggle and people can't put their finger on what, what it is that's going on, what it is that, is, like, isn't sitting right. Mm. I think largely it's that. It's the just people were so detached from what people have evolved doing for so many thousands of years. And I, if it continues on this path, I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing, but I think you can't deny that that is how we've lived for so long. Mm. And to have that separation, it's like small things like watching a campfire. Mm. It, you can just stare at it. It's just stare at it for hours and like not say anything. Yeah. Yeah. And like, listening to the rain on your window while you're dry inside. Like, I feel like that connects to something so deep within us because it meant so much to our ancestors to be listening to rain, but still dry. That is such a like important thing because it means that you're safe, you're dry, you're inside, you're not being the elements and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. I like that. It's good. It's good thoughts. Like, yeah, it's like almost like sometimes the extremes of life, uh, you know, when you allow ex- extreme extreme stuff into your life, it's like it, it almost, you know, like when you're buggered from a day spearfishing, you don't, you don't have a better night's sleep in your life. You know, you actually sleep seven hours yeah. straight, easy. And uh, whereas sometimes it's like if you sit at a desk all day, you live a life of, you know, like nothing really happens during the day. You might feel anxious and stuff like does happen. I'm not saying it doesn't, but, 
Mm. Like physically and nothing around you really dramatically changes and then you try to go to bed that night. I just, like there's a sense of dissatisfaction and I wonder we have problems sleeping and stuff. Like, um, mm-hmm. I think so. Moving, uh, was there anything else you wanted to cover with, like any anything else with regards to this broader conversation about mental health, sort of anxiety, stress, and how as it pertains to sparing in everyday life? Um, not really, to be honest. I was pretty comfy with how that's gone. Yeah, yeah, I enjoyed it too. Um, a, a great segue out of this. Um, funny shit. Like, uh, yeah. have, have you pooed in your wetsuit? Have you uh, have you grog bogged your mate? Have you done any of those awful things that uh, I find incredibly amusing? No pooing, uh, luckily, but um, definitely uh, getting seasick, and as we would call here, uh, booting and vomiting, spewing, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Um, that's always an entertaining one. I've definitely had that on a few dives where the water's a bit greener, there's a little bit of swell, and you start getting the feelings of being a little nauseous, and then next thing you know, you're sort of vomiting in the water around you, and all the baits coming up and going crazy, and you're just hanging on to your float for dear life, looking at land, just praying that you can get back there pretty soon. So <laughs> I that's probably a fairly common one, but it's definitely they're usually the more entertaining times in the water when you're sort of just pissing yourself laughing, just vomiting, like looking at your mate and your mate's like stoked because there's bait getting turned up and stuff. <laughs> you know? um, Dehydration is a bit of a concern of getting seasick. Have you, do you take uh, medication now for seasickness? How do you get around it? Uh, not particularly. Uh, I always try and hydrate before I dive. Um, it's definitely a massive one. I know people like Daniel Mann and stuff sometimes talk about putting some water on your float, which is probably a good idea, especially if you're going on longer dives or longer swims. Mm. Um, but yeah, generally, I don't really take medication. It, it doesn't happen very often. It is usually just when the swells up, and it's usually ends up being one of those days, like we sort of spoke about, where you're really having to wait out, getting back onto the rocks, and having to watch your mates a bit closer and that. I'm not even old, but here is my claim to being old. I cramp out sometimes these days. And when mm-hmm. you you know, when you're half a mile off the shore or, you know, whatever, like cramping out all of a sudden becomes quite a serious issue. Especially when you're a big unit like me. Like I don't want to put my uh dog buddy through the hell of potentially dragging me back to shore. So yeah. lately I've been smashing um Aqualite, which is mm-hmm. in WA. I just add a sachet of it or even like if I'm out on extended trips, I'll smash one in the morning and I'll smash another one at night in a full bottle of water. And uh, it's full of like essential salts. I think there's magnesium in yeah. it, real good stuff. They use it in like um, heavy industrial environments where people sweat all day in the heat. Mm. I have not found anything to hydrate as well as that. Awesome. I'm going to check that out. Um, yeah, that's definitely what I've heard with cramping is the hydration part of it, mm. which can get tricky when you're just swimming around in salt water all day. Well, water's great. I like water. I've got no issues with water. I think it's fantastic. But the reality is I don't think it replaces all the stuff that gets um, pulled out of your body when you're pissing in your suit all day and, and uh, out in the ocean for yeah. 10 hours at a time. So, yeah. Definitely. Um, dive bag. What's in your dive bag? Sydney, Northern Beaches diving, day in, day out. What are you using head to toe? Uh, head and toe, i got a Cressy suit. Uh, at the moment, I started with a three and a half mil top and bottom. Do you know, the, um, do you know which Cressy suit it is? Uh, the Technica, I believe I had, three and a half mil. Love that suit. Yeah, awesome suit. A uh, few people talk about Cressy's getting holes and stuff, but I, in two years, I've never had holes, and any of them that did form, at least in the Technica, um, they were from me just rubbing up on rocks and things that I could repair myself. I think um, you've got maybe a couple of entry level type suits now, and but the Technica I think is still a little bit more expensive, and for good reason. It's kind of got the that neoprene they use and the way they cut it and stuff like it just seems to be a suit that lasts. You don't get too much compression, but it's still a fair d- degree of um, flexibility in them. Oh, that was one of my first suits. I loved the friggin' thing. Mm. Yeah, I'm definitely up for an upgrade soon. I've been using a five mil top just as my diving got a bit better, a bit deeper. Yep. Uh, again, the Cressy, but I had a few problems with that one getting holes in it, unfortunately, yep. um, just with stitching and stuff. But um, other than that, I'm super impressed with my Cressy gear. Yep. Um, Salvador Mask, Salvador Noah Mask. Okay. I've gone through a bunch of masks 
and the Salvman Noah, I've uh, bought that one multiple times. Okay. Just like losing gear and that kind of stuff. Um, it's been my favorite. Super low volume, really soft silicon around the nose, um, yep. which is always good and doesn't push on the head. Yep, cool. Uh, I got Rob Allen's gun. I, people ask me about what guns to get. I always say Rob Allen because it's like... It's spearfishing. You can't go wrong. You can't. You can't. And it's, they're so simple. And But that's the point. They like they don't fail. I've never had one fail aside from like I think we talk about rabbit holes and like tinkering and all that kind of stuff. I love that. So I love making things difficult for myself and uh, ended up building myself a Rob Allen roller and sort of playing around with that. Definitely uh, listening to the Coastman podcast a few times, trying to sort of tinker with that setup and get it all set up. And his podcast series and uh, his video series on YouTube's awesome for that. Pretension um, massive with that and keeping your hmm. shooting line path logical. Um, yeah. With whatever muzzle setup you've got, like yeah. the weird little things with them. Um, if you don't mind pissing around with gear, rollers are great. I Definitely a lot of tinkering with them though. Yeah, I have a love hate. I At the moment, Duncan Henderson in New Zealand built me one and it's mm-hmm. a Royal Island custom with uh, his uh, muzzle on it and I friggin' love the thing, eh? I, yeah. It's deadly. Like the range on it compared to conventional spear gun. Because I've been using my cell. Sorry, this is an aside, man. <laughs> no, 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 no. Listen, listen. I've been using my Salva Mar Heroes. I've got a 105 and a 125, and I freaking love them, man. Super, super simple. Um, I changed the bands out. I've got like, um, I think it's 14.5 mil, uh, like low internal diameter um, mm-hmm. prime line and I yeah. love them. They shoot magic. Um, throw in stainless shafts. They've got a loading tab. I use the fin shafts now and um, beautiful guns. Love them. Super accurate and, and they, mm-hmm. they suit my style of spearfishing. But I, as soon as I got in the water with Duncan Henderson's roller, it shot exactly where I aimed it, pinpoint, mm-hmm. and it throws the spear like further than my 125 and it's a 100. And, yeah. and it throws it faster and it throws it further so and it's super accurate so I, I cannot complain with it and um but when i go to change out the rubber myself and bugger it up then i'll probably throw it on the shelf again and then <laughs> pick up my salva mark because like something about simple guns man like you just you sometimes I think, yeah i've uh i started with a 900 sparrow my bone mm-hmm. and then traded that with a mate for a 900 roller, which I got the roller head. So that's how I got my roller head. Yep. Um, I didn't want to buy one. I just hated it. That gun, unfortunately, had a lot of holes in it. So the barrel was flooded and whatever else. Um, so then I've slowly changed that 900 into back to a standard head. Okay. And then I've got an 1100 roller now, which I love. Um, but like we sort of saying, there's a lot of playing around with it when you're building it yourself, trying to get it balanced and get it shooting right. Mm. But I think there is a part of me that wants to just throw it in the bin and go simple again. You can't be simple. Well, I, I've been chatting recently like with people about spear guns and stuff, and like you just never want to have doubt in your mind about when you're going to pull the trigger. You want that thing to shoot where you're pointing it and what you're pointing at. If you've done everything right to put yourself in a special in a special position to shoot a really special fish, the last thing you want is to doubt the equipment that you're using. And it's like, how much do you want to pay for that peace of mind or spend in the garage and in the pool tinkering with it to make sure that you have 100% peace of mind. I've seen really experienced Spiros um, that get in a funk with a particular spear gun and they try every frigging thing to fix it. And then you start doubting yourself and your shooting technique and you you get mm. lost in a negative spiral and you, and you can lose a whole day of spearing just on negative. Mm. Um, so sometimes it's like, I'm just going to go with that. I know it works. Bang, bang, bang. It's got some limitations, but it does exactly what I want. Exactly. No. Exactly. Yeah. I can get what, I get what you're saying about the roll balance, but um, <laughs> yeah, we got lost of that. Um, what else? Yeah. Um, just plastic things at the moment. Yep. Sort of have, hasn't been in the budget to upgrade that, but um, definitely on the cards, the next thing I'll probably invest a bit of money into is uh, a bit of a thin upgrade. Are you going to go composites or carbon fiber? Composite thing. I need something durable. And from what I've heard, the carbons are just a little less durable. Um, but yeah, definitely. I'm pretty rough with all my gear. Like I, I clean all my gear. I give it a good wash and fresh water. Yep. But um, I'm not afraid to sort of clang things on the rocks a bit and throw things around. 
Yeah, and you're clambering up rock walls when there's swell and stuff. Like the last thing you want is a delicate bit of, um, you know, two-ply carbon fibre or something like that. Um, mm. So it will definitely last you longer. I think the good thing too about some of the, the Australian manufacturers and, and the New Zealand um, guys as well is like um, their fins made for spearfishing applications. Like the, mm. some of the high-performance stuff is great for competitive freediving and all the rest of it, but will it stand up to a rugged shore dive? Like probably, yeah. Probably not. And then you've just spent whatever it is, like five, 600 bucks on a pair of fins that are that great in the swimming pool and great when you go diving in the Mediterranean or, you know, like Dean's Blue, yeah. something like that. But jump off a, off a, off a beach and, you know, like a headland in Sydney, like it's probably not the best application for it. Yeah, exactly. It unless is quite well. Got, unless you got money to throw at things. Yeah. Unfortunately, we don't know. But so yeah. as long as you get penetrator, that's all I'm saying. Use the code NoSparrow, save 25 bucks. <laughs> that's all right. I'll be on it. Penetrator, was it? Yeah, man. Yeah, you can't go wrong Perfect. with that stuff. Made on the Gold Coast. Perfect. He's a good dude. Yep. Never, I never hesitate to recommend his stuff. But um, oh, yeah, that's what I use. I've had his, I've had, just talking about that, I've had his carbons for six or seven years, you know. Mm. Um, I'm due for a new set, uh, I'll be honest. So yeah. I hope later. Oh, maybe we get a little group order happening. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. Let's do it. Um, cool. Uh, all right. Any other gear you wanted to make mention of? Not particularly. Pretty, pretty straightforward. Pretty simple. Always playing around with stuff, but little flashes and things. I think that's maybe something if people are interested in making. I've uh, been really enjoying PVC conduit, and you just you on eBay you can buy a pack of like a hundred uh, reflective stickers, and you just like wrap the reflective stickers around the PVC and um it gets pretty easy to lose them so you kind of want to be careful how you use them but if you're throwing them with like both open end on each end they sink really slow and like flutter back and forth a bit as they sink and that's how i've shot a few fish actually i shot a um my first bonito ever was down on eden on the south coast mm. and um never really seen them or have them like come in real close before but um through the flasher and the whole school of them just came straight in and they're all just buzzing the flasher, buzzing the flasher and you could sort of come down and they had no interest in what I was doing. They were, all they wanted was this little PVC bit of plastic that cost me five bucks to make. So, yeah. so no ballast in it? Just the PVC with the reflective stuff? No ballast. Yeah. Just open PVC with probably like 20 mil diameter um, reflective stickers on it. Happy days. Sick. Love it, man. Cool. All right. I'm going to experiment with that myself. Um, some people just throwing a teaspoon or mm. uh, everyone sort of has a different version of it but especially if you're in blue water it seems to be a game changer 100% fish go nuts for it anything shiny Nuba's good news did you know that every pair of penetrator fins receives a protective layer of Kevlar 49 multi-axial reinforcement you don't even know what that means it means that it prevents chips and cracking. It means you're gonna get longevity out of your fins. And that's exactly what you need when you're spending some dollars on some good fins. Visit penetratorfins.com, get yourself a pair of reinforced super tough fins with beyond industry warranty at penetratorfins.com. Use the code at NoobSpirit to save $25 on any pair of penetrator blades. That's right, use the code at NoobSpirit to save $25 on any pair of blades at penetratorfins.com. Today's podcast is brought to you by Killshot Spear Guns. Ed Martin makes dependable, reliable, simple spear guns that you can rely on. Check them out at killshotspearguns.com. But it's not just me saying it. Have a listen to what this bloke's got to say about it. Well, I just love Ed Martin's Killshot Spear Guns. They just shoot fish all day long. But it's not just the Americans saying it. He's even sold some spear guns in the UK. That's right, Shrek. I just love a kill shot spear gun. I've been shooting bass and all sorts of cod and pollock and God knows what down here in the lock and around and uh, this the end of my accent. But uh, yeah, I love kill shot spear guns. Keep them coming, Ed. And uh, even the Australians are getting in on it. Ed makes a quality, reliable uh, platform. Have a listen to what um, Stu had to say when I got hold of him last time. Oh, joy, Shrek, I got on to bloody kill shot spear guns last time I heard you gobbing on about them on the podcast, and I just got on, I wanted a reliable uh, bloody uh, tough spear gun, so I got on kill shot, I saved, I used the code, the bloody uh, noob code there, the nooba, 
at on killshotspearguns.com. Got myself an American bit of my, uh, timber spear gun. And jeepers, mate, this thing is shooting crocs on. Oh, this it's so bloody good, mate. Uh, don't don't listen to me about the crocs, say it's illegal. But I do like to shoot the odd bearer. <laughs> Get on to him. Get into him. I'm out. See you, mate. You didn't just hear it from me. Buy American-made performance at killshotspearguns.com. Get $30 off any spear gun when you use the code NUBA on killshotspearguns.com. All right, man, we're going to head on out. Faster race, faster pace round of questions. It's Spiro Q&A. Are you ready? I'm not going, I am. Let's go. not going to go in any order here. We're going to... We're going to All righty. Mix it up. I got my notes. So. All right. Notes. What is uh, your dream spearfishing destination? If you could go anywhere for like one week and shoot any or target any fish, what, where would you go? Who would you go with? WA. WA is uh, basically what I'm building my car for, is to finish my apprenticeship and drive to WA and then stay there for however long I stay there. Western Australia. So you see yourself driving to the southern end of WA and then sort of driving around and up or how are you going to approach it? plan is to just uh, start from Sydney, drive south, hit Tassie on the way, go through Melbourne, Aussie Bight, southwestern Australia, Ooh. and then head all the way up north is the plan. Nice plan, man. Love it. Um, who is your favourite person to go spearfishing with and why? My favourite person, probably just a few of my mates. I mentioned Davis before. He, he always shocks me. He's like, just love and ability in the ocean and just yeah awesome awesome young lad and he's doing some crazy stuff with his photos so I think everyone should go check that out for sure he's been in a got a few surfing magazine photos recently and a few big swells we've had here so sick stoked for him all right what is the single best piece of advice you've ever been given for spearfishing uh, like we mentioned before I ain't slowing down that's the biggest one I always forget about it but it's always the one to come back to all right cool Last question, man. Could you describe what the spearfishing experience means to you in one sentence? Freedom. One word. (laughs) Boom. That's the shortest answer I've had yet, man. I love it, Josh. Um, So people can come follow you on Instagram. It's um, at bosch.jollen, J-O-L-L-E-N. But if you come to today's show, it's noobspirit.com forward slash bollen, like pollen but with a B, then uh, you will find – all the stuff we've chatted about today linked up and uh, you'll be able to follow Josh on Insta. Have you got a uh, YouTube channel, Josh? I don't. I'm working on a few little video things and on that trip we were just talking about, I do have some ideas and some plans to put together for that. But uh, yeah, YouTube channel sort of in the works, but I'm sort of still figuring that out. Hit me up when you go. I will uh, send you some contacts all along your merry way. And uh, Legend, man. I appreciate yep. that. And, and likewise, if you're listening and you are in any of those areas where Josh sort of plans to hit, hit him up, send him a message and hook up with him. He's a mad dude and I'm sure you guys will have a ball. So, um, Josh, to it. man, absolute pleasure. 99 Spiro Recipes coming along as well. I think we'll be well and truly live at kickstarter.com forward slash, sorry, noobspiro.com forward slash 99 recipes. I'll link that up in today's show notes as well. People can go and check out our Kickstarter campaign. Buy yourself a copy, buy three, get one for your grandmother. Um, there's a bunch of cool recipes in there from Josh. And um, man, yeah, like, like I said, cool chat with you today. Yeah, pleasure, man. Thank you for having me on. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed listening to Josh and I riff and chat. I really enjoyed interviewing him and I hope you enjoyed and took away something from today's interview. Um, If you didn't get the message already, please go to noobspiro.com forward slash 99 recipes. Jump on 99 Spiro recipes if you believe in this project. It's crowdsourced recipes from Spiros from all over the world just like you. There's been a lot of work going to this project and uh, I'm super stoked it's already reached its funding goal. There's plenty more cool packages available if you want to back it. There's different rewards award tiers check it out noobspiro.com forward slash 99 recipes or go to kickstarter.com and type in 99 spiro recipes next week we're off to chat with james sacker um i called josh a renaissance man james sacker very interesting character absolutely crazy about spearing and he has loved it for a long 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 time uh one of the most interesting spearfishing hunting techniques i have ever heard on the noob spirit podcast drops in this interview and it's and it's coming out in less than a week 
check it out James Sacker join me here on the Noob Sparrow podcast subscribe listen learn share it with your mates leave a review thanks for the stoke and the passion really appreciate you guys getting behind 99 Sparrow recipes on Kickstarter as well means a hell of a lot really appreciate you guys that's it for me today I'm over and out today's episode was an absolute banger and so is our major sponsor, Adreno. Visit them at adreno.com.au. They have a huge range of equipment. And you can find it at adreno.com.au. Use the code NoobSpirit at checkout. When you shop online, you can save $20 on every purchase over 200 You can even use that code in-store at some of their huge mega stores Australia-wide. Price be guarantee on any Australian spearfishing equipment price. Again, visit them at adreno.com.au. Use the code NoobSpirit. I had a moment the other day on the Noob Spirit podcast where I felt like I'd made it. Manscaped sent me an email. They're sponsoring the podcast. So support for today's episode of the Noob Spirit podcast is brought to you by Manscaped. Now, they sent me a cool care package and I got to trial it out. I friggin' love it. I've got the Lawnmower 4.0. You can get yours at manscaped.com. Save 20% off and get free shipping if you use the code Noob Spirit in one word at manscaped.com. I friggin' love it. There's no more awkward mess hanging out the side of the smugglers anymore my balls started doing recovery breathing (gasps) moments after i finished my shave i want you to get what i've got smooth goodness down there uh your balls will thank you use the code at noobspiro all in one word at manscaped.com 20 percent off free shipping manscaped.com noobspiro unlock your confidence always use the right tools for the job with manscaped your balls will thank you Have you visited neptonics.com? If you are building spear guns, I bet you have. They have got a huge assortment of top quality components for gun builders. Not only that, but they sell all sorts of equipment. They are the one-stop shop for all spearfishing essentials, particularly in the USA. They also have free shipping on orders over $99 in the USA. And a great deal for Noobers today, you can save 10% off your entire order when you use the code NOOB10 at checkout. Go to niptonics.com, use the code NOOB10, 10% off.